things recording. Hello, welcome to our Q&A panel again um, for the Chinese cinema season. The Chinese cinema season is the biggest online uh, film festival to promote Chinese language film in the UK and the EU. It is co-presented by Trinity Cine Asia, Filming East Film Festival and UK China Film Collab. My name is Human Chan. I am the founder of UK China Film Collab, and I'm here today to talk to, to talk to Dr. Carl Bowerman about martial arts cinema, in specific about Yip Man. And the reason why is because Yip Man One and Yip Man Two are currently showing um, at the cinema season, and it will be there, available for streaming until the 23rd of May. For those who are in the region. If you haven't seen the film, do go on the website to check them out. And I think it's the best to watch them in a double bill manner. So to introduce Kyle a little bit, Dr. Kyle Barman is a media and cinema studies lecturer in Chicago. He received his PhD from Cardiff University where we did um, PhD together. He has taught courses at the Paul University, Columbia College, Chicago College of the Lake County and Harper College. He has published widely in and between film studies and philosophy on subjects ranging from authorship, genre theory, and aesthetic to skepticism, professionalism, and ordinary language of philosophy. And his major research interests in film include classical and contemporary American cinema and international action and martial arts cinema. Hello, hello Kyle. Thank you for being with us today. Hi, right, thanks for the invite. And well, just to kick things off a little bit, how, since when did you become interested in martial arts cinema? Uh, well, the joke that I always like to say is that for as long as I've had the ability to form memories, I can't remember a time that I wasn't obsessed with Bruce Lee. That's mainly my dad's fault because he grew up in Chicago in the 1970s when the martial arts kung fu craze was starting to take over America, especially in inner cities like Los Angeles, Chicago, New York. So he got to see those movies. He got to raid the kung fu shops and the martial arts stores that were cropping up, buying books, magazines, following all that when he was a kid. And he basically just raised me the same way. So I was a kid, grew up watching Bruce Lee movies and I had the good fortune of growing up watching Bruce Lee and Steven Seagal. So I got the best of Hong Kong and I got the best of Hollywood. And all of my life growing up, I've been watching Hong Kong martial arts cinema, watching Hollywood martial arts cinema. And then as it's become popular, I've just become a connoisseur of world cinema and anything with martial arts, I will watch it. And then once became a film scholar, started teaching, then this love of martial arts movies became a great excuse for it to be a research project. So now I study them professionally. But that's great. And when you were a, when you were a kid, was it accessible for for you to watch these Bruce Lee films? Where were they? Were they on the te telly, television, or? Well, <coughs> the Bruce Lee movies in my house were so big that pretty much every technology that's existed, my dad and I have owned the Bruce Lee movies. So he had Bruce Lee on Betamax, on VHS, on DVD, on Blu-ray. Any way to get Bruce Lee movies? we would have them. So I always had them. They were always accessible. The very first movies I have, I have a picture of me at like eight years old holding a tape of Enter the Dragon and Steven Seagal's Above the Law. So the home video market was very big and the ability to have tapes and DVDs meant I became a collector very quickly. And yeah, those movies have always been in my house, always right within reach in case I want to watch something again. Why do you think it is about Bruce Lee that is so... Um, transnational. What is this is, is that, that that is so fascinating for you when you first saw the moment of Bruce Lee appearing on screen? What was the thing that really captured you the attention and fascination like that? I don't know. It, it's hard to tap back into that. I mean, just when you're a kid and you have no conception of, oh, look at the technique there. Oh, that looks realistic. Look at the cinematography and editing. As a kid, I think it's just the raw charisma that he had. He was an amazing screen presence. And the fact that he grew up acting even before he was doing martial arts meant he's kind of had a leg up on most people because he has the training. He knows cameras. He knows how to be a nonverbal actor, whether he has lines. He can emote and act with his verbal skills, with just his physical presence. And I think that's just what captured and captivated me initially. Just seeing him on screen, he was such a magnetic 
per performer. Then mm -hmm. as you grow up, and the reason that he appeals to so many people across so many years, decades, yeah. half a century now coming up since his death, I think it's because he can get so many people to connect with him for their own particular reasons and just for general universal reasons. So if you are someone who is Asian, you can identify with Bruce's story, trying to get into Hollywood, trying to make it. You can identify with the narratives, the stories about sort of the Chinese underdog and Fist of Fury with the persecution of the Japanese, those very real sentiments, historical events. And then even if you are from the other side of the world, <clears throat> even from the other side of the world, growing up in America, you can just see the amazing martial artist, the unbelievable techni techniques that he's doing, the way that it's shot, the way that it's edited. They're just great films, great action sequences. So there are no shortage of reasons that anyone around the world at any time period, whatever you go to the movies for, there's something there for you to connect with. He just has that kind of particular and universal appeal. So it's not necessary that necessarily that he's Chinese or American born Chinese and maybe he's maybe it's because of his persona and everything else around him just make it a, a perfect package for people to consume and to identify. And I think that is quite rare as well. And also, of course, he introduced martial arts to to people around the world, people who can remember that nowadays they are training either Kung Fu or Wing Chun or you know, all sorts of martial arts. They, I, I have, I'm quite certain that most of them had the inspiration from watching Bruce Lee on screen. Would you agree with that? Yeah, and I think that <clears throat> even if it isn't conscious, even if it isn't intended, just he is in the DNA of martial arts, certainly in the contemporary sense. To the point where, I mean, someone like a scholar, Paul Bowman, who's written a lot about Bruce Lee and martial arts, has pointed out that just the very concept in the English language of martial arts, you can really trace that to Bruce Lee. He's using that in English language interviews. He's using that in films that are being released in America, in the UK. Just the concept in English of martial arts. All the different terms people have had throughout history in the Chinese language, the Japanese language the English concept of martial arts is really traceable to him. Then when you go on with different movies, yes, Jean-Claude Van Damme is huge and Bloodsport is amazing. Bloodsport is Enter the Dragon. You go on to something like the UFC, a real competition, an actual sporting event, and they're mentioning Bruce Lee. People are coming in saying they've trained in Jeet Kune Do. Just anywhere you find martial arts, Bruce Lee is going to be there somewhere, even if it's just a picture hanging in the training hall. He's very much in the DNA of martial arts, especially within the last half century. Do you think his legacy is replaceable? So we can now go into talk a little bit about Donnie Yen. So don't both Donnie Yen and, and Bruce Lee, you know, they both are, are real martial arts and practitioners themselves and turn actors and, and movie stars. So what is that different? Or, or is he different from Bruce Lee? Or is does Donnie Yen appeal to a younger audience, do you think? Or, or is the Bruce Lee legacy still very strong, a presence that, um, that is very difficult to be overtaken? Yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly hard to be overtaken. I'm, if I say it's impossible, it's just because of my Bruce Lee bias. But it's certainly going to be a difficult challenge for anyone. But I think that what has been interesting is that pretty much from the beginning, as soon as Bruce died, not many people really even stepped up to the plate and said, I want to be the next Bruce Lee. I mean, it's the famous story with Jackie Chan. Once Raymond Chow and Lo Wei are starting to, okay, who are we going to make movies with next? Even Jackie was like, don't make me the next Bruce Lee. I'll do <laughs> martial arts movies. I can find my own thing. I can be my own person. I can do my own martial arts. I can find kind of my own persona, which he did. But even he had the foresight in the late 70s when he was a very young, very green actor, just, I don't want to be the next Bruce Lee. So he has done things in his career where he kind of takes the Bruce Lee legacy or the afterlife, whatever you want to call it, and sort of transformed it in his own way. So there's no getting away from Bruce Lee. And so what a lot of people, Jackie Chan has done it, Jet Li has done it, and Donnie Yen has been the most recent person to do it. They don't shy away from Bruce Lee. They don't pretend that he doesn't exist. There's no getting away from the shadow cast by the dragon, especially if you're making a Hong Kong martial arts movie. There's just no way to do that. So what they've done is make sure that they're not just imitating him. So anything that they do, you can find traces of Bruce Lee. And I think the main 
elements from those three stars films that I mentioned. In the film Wheels on Meals, Jackie Chan's classic fight scene with Benny the Jet or Quidas, that is basically Bruce Lee versus Chuck Norris from The Way of the Dragon. That's the flow of that fight, the general evolution of Jackie's character. Like, I need to change the way I'm fighting. I need to do this differently in order to overtake this bigger, stronger, faster, et cetera guy. Same basic premise as Bruce Lee versus Chuck Norris, but done in Jackie's way. Jackie's the clown. He needs to find the way. I need to have fun and stop taking this so seriously. Not the same lesson that Bruce Lee taught, but it's kind of saying, here's my way of doing this. Jet Li does this as well in not only the remake of Fist of Fury, Fist of Legend, but even in different things like Kiss of the Dragon, where he has his own homage to the Fist of Fury storming the dojo scene. He does it, but he does it his way. And Donnie Yen, I mean, Ip Man, it's not a stretch to say that that is essentially a remake of Fist of Fury. But the way that it's done, it's done in Donnie's way. The storytelling style is different. And of course, the martial artistry is different. So here, it's not Bruce sort of pushing his very strong, very aggressive ideas of realistic street fighting combat. Here, it's we're going to do this in the context of a story about Chinese identity, about the historical context with Japan, very similar to Fist of Fury, and then to promote and showcase the rather underrepresented and neglected art of Wing Chun. So you're always going to find Bruce Lee. There's no getting away from him. But you'll see the different things that people do to sort of give their own spin on it or take things in different directions. And I think Donnie Yen did it maybe better than anybody in Ip Man. I agree with you because I think Donnie definitely, before Ip Man, um, Donnie Yen was always always about, you know, but he was playing some more minor roles rather than taking a lead. I think Ip Man really made him um, mm -hmm. and definitely made, made the screen persona for him, for people to identify. And... And Iman has a very different approach to, to Bruce Lee as well. He's a bit more gentle. You know, he, he's got a different sort of philosophy of martial arts. Can you elaborate a little bit um, more on that? Yeah that's, yeah, that's one of the interesting things. And I brought up Fist of Legend with Jet Li. And that is a direct remake of Fist of Fury. Ip Man is, let's call it an indirect remake. But both of those films, the stars have very different personas. They're playing very different characters with very different outlooks and approaches. So in Fist of Fury, just because that's such an iconic Bruce Lee text, yeah, he is seething with rage. It's coming out of his eyes. He goes through that entire movie looking for a fight. It's the classic revenge quest. Fist of Legend is very different. Jet Li does not have that persona. He's not looking for a fight. He only fights when he absolutely has to. That's more what Donnie Yen is doing in this film. When you go through history, it's very hard to find information on Ip Man's life, just the difficulties, all the turbulence, everything that was going on at the time where he was. It's very hard to find concrete information, but there's a great book by Ben Judkins and John Nielsen, The Creation of Wing Chun, which gives a lot of great evidence and a lot of support for what was happening historically and who Ip Man really seemed to be. And his persona, he was sort of a jokey type of guy, had a good sense of humor, like Donnie. He would often play around with people. He's not there to hurt anybody. And there also seems to be a little of the Wong Fei Hung archetype. Because yes, Bruce Lee is an enormous figure in martial arts cinema, but he's not the only one. There are a lot of very classic figures throughout the history of martial arts cinema. And Wong Fei Hung is right up there with Bruce Lee from Quan Ta King all the way up to Jet Li's reinterpretation in Once Upon a Time in China. And that sort of peaceable pacifist, I'm a nice guy, I'm polite, don't make me fight. But when I'm backed into a corner, then I will fight. That's more the archetype that Donnie Yen is working from, as opposed to Bruce's more aggressive revenge-seeking person. So Donnie isn't looking for a fight, even when the Japanese invade, even when they take over his home, even when he's just a homeless guy working a horrible life as a coal miner, basically. He's not out there looking for a fight. It's only when other people are being hurt or when his family is in danger. So it is a very different type of character with a very different outlook, more explicitly Confucian sort of gentlemanly. 
I think definitely Iman for me, I would relate, I would relate it to, to, I would relate to it more than Bruce Lee for some reason. It's just because of the philosophy behind it, that he's very gentle and he's not really looking for troubles. You know, as you said, that he only fights when he needs to, but when he does, he will always wins. And I, that kind of attitude is, is a bit more gentle, I think. And whereas Bruce Lee, I think it appeals to definitely to the African-American community in the 70s at, at that time is because it gives them a very strong um, leading figure for them to admire, for them to, to become, to look towards so that they can uh, gear themselves up to, to fight and also to, you know, to uh, resist a social um, conflicts and also the, all, the, all the troubles around them as well. They're very different indeed. And for you, who would you, who do you, who do you, I would say like better, who do you identify more in terms of the character? And, and do you think Donnie Yen has, as, has, um, as wide, a wide reach as Bruce Lee internationally? Do you think international audience can relate to him the same way they do or once upon a time they did with Bruce Lee? Um, well, <clears throat> let's try. So the first question there, who do I identify with more? Bruce Lee, the person, Bruce Lee, the man, I like him. I like his personality. I like his approach to martial arts. He's just a very clear-headed guy and a great sense of humor. I like him as a person. In terms of the characters that he played, I don't really identify with any of them. So he often would play sort of the slow-witted with a big heart type of country bumpkin guy. So he kind of sets up to where the odds are stacked against him. He's a fish out of water, whether he's coming to Thailand, whether he's coming back to Shanghai, whether he's going to Rome, whether he's going to some weird martial arts tournament, he's always gonna be the fish out of water. And he's always going to either have a bunch of people persecuting him or the people around him or a revenge quest, someone he has to go hunt down and kill. Those types of characters, those types of stories, no, I don't really connect to that. I don't have any large revenge quests and I don't have that kind of persecution. Donnie Yen's character as Ip Man is easier to connect with, easier to identify with because he's someone who is just very into his martial arts. So he's someone who is daily, in his day-to-day -day life, he's consumed with martial arts, wants to be as good as he can be, and then has to sort of balance just the realities of being a practicing martial artist, and then later in the second film, being a teacher of martial arts, and then being a family man. So it's a little more down-to-earth, easier to connect to type of character, and the story is easier to relate to on those sort of general thematic levels. Then to the second question, for what I just said about how it's easier to relate to Donnie Yen, I think just the emotional impact of Bruce's stories, and again, just his screen presence and his persona, I think he has the more widespread appeal because like I was saying earlier, individuals can connect to him so strongly given their own specifics, wherever they come from, their background, what's going on in their life. So like you were alluding to the famous connection, especially in the 70s, right when it happened of the African-American communities especially in the US and the UK, sort of disenfranchised people and disenfranchised cultures have someone to connect to. I'm not Chinese. I'm not coming from this perspective as the China versus Japan thing. I have no connection to that as a black inner city youth in New York or Chicago, but that's a person of color. They're going up against big white evil Westerners. I can kind of connect to that. And then he just has that kind of broad appeal to where Donnie Yen, I think, is in more of a specific project. He's more connected to Hong Kong in particular and more connected to sort of the Chinese identity and the legacy of Chinese martial arts. So I don't think he has as widespread of an appeal, but he does have the benefit of not dying shortly. So Bruce made just a couple of movies and then that was it. Donnie Yen is now following an interesting path because he's jumping back and forth between Hong Kong and Hollywood. So now with his Star Wars stuff, he's getting a lot of exposure and that kind of exposure then allows people to say, well, here's this cool guy in the Star Wars universe. Now I can go see this cool guy over here. So he is doing a very good job of sort of jumping back and forth, getting more eyeballs on him and by extension, getting more people to come from 
something like Star Wars with jazz roots in Japanese samurai stuff and Kung Fu legends, sort of getting people to come from that world into more of a Hong Kong martial arts world. So he's doing a great job with what he has now as sort of his star persona. But I still, if push comes to shove, Bruce Lee is the king. Well, I think it helps because um, Donnie Yen speaks quite good English as well. I think comparing to other uh, you know, actors who also try to break into Hollywood. I think Donnie is definitely, he has a, um, well, J Jackie Chan is another thing, you know, he also had a very international appeal and, and definitely still very um, legendary for many audience. But I think Donnie, um, comparing Donnie to Jet Li, let's say, I think he does have a more international appeal. And let's see, I'm quite excited to see where he will end up, you know, in, you know, what he will be doing next in Hollywood. I guess what sometimes what really frustrates me is that these guys are brilliant. And then when they go to Hollywood, they, they always pick up some minor roles in these mega pictures and it just doesn't really make them shine in any way and and for them it's quite attractive in a way you know it's an opportunity and in Hollywood probably they wouldn't even think about it but in some sometimes it does damage a little bit of um you know what they have already created in in Hong Kong cinema for themselves on screen yeah, that's that I would yeah it's there are two different ways that you can do it and they're both risky so mm. just historically I mean, Bruce set the template, but he was working off the Clint Eastwood and Charles Bronson template of like, I'm not really being a star here, so I'm going to go somewhere else, become a star, then come in the back door. But you generally have two different ways to try to make it. If you're already a known commodity and you're already a star in one place, then you're either going to come over, let's say, from Hong Kong to Hollywood, just to keep this example with people like Bruce Lee, Jackie Chan, Jet Li, Donnie Yen. Either I'm going to come over here and the movie's going to be about me. I'm going to be the star. It's going to be about me. And now we can show this new audience who I am and what I'm about. That's option one. Option two is I'm going to go into something that already has an established sort of presence. So it's not going to be about me, but I'm going to be a part of this thing. You're going to see that I didn't ruin it. I'm good. I fit in this. Now come see me over here. So those are sort of the two different ways that you can try to make it in that other market. So someone like Jackie Chan sort of struggled to really break in. So he's mm. like, I got to find the vehicle that makes me look the best. And so he would make a movie like the one Cannonball Run and something yeah. like The Protector. He would make movies that they're not bad movies, but they don't show him off in the best way. They're not the most Jackie Chan-ness that he can possibly do. And so it just doesn't work the same. But then when he finds great material, like the Rush Hour film, where it's sort of a buddy cop thing, it's not just about him, he's working in an established Hollywood convention, that archetypal buddy cop film, then it's kind of like, okay, after Rumble in the Bronx and then Rush Hour, that one-two punch, that works for him. Someone like Jet Li comes over and he's the villain. He's the bad guy in Lethal Weapon 4. And you go, who the hell is this guy? He's so cool. He kind of went the Arnold Schwarzenegger route. It's like, we watch him as the bad guy. He's so awesome in The Terminator. Now I'll root for him. So you mm. watch Jet Li come in. He's such an amazing performance in Lethal Weapon 4 as that terrifying villain, which I don't know if it's just apocryphal or if it's true, but I believe Jackie Chan turned that down because he didn't want to play the bad guy. He's like, I don't want, especially I don't want American viewers to associate me with the bad guy who they're not going to love and root for. Jet Li was like, sure, let's try this and maybe it'll work. And then he becomes the star and then you become to watch films with him as the hero. So there are different ways to try to break in. Donnie Yen seems to be going the route of, let me establish myself, let people know who I am. I'm mm. connected to things that are very big that they already like me notwithstanding. But then my presence here, people have such diehard relations to something like Star Wars or people if you're going to show up in a superhero movie. I want to be in something where someone is going to love it, love me in it. And then because I'm here, they'll follow me to something else. So I think it's really just up to the future if Donnie Yen will have some kind of big starring vehicle that's all about him from Hollywood in the English language, in something like an American context. It'll be interesting to see if he goes that route. Yeah, definitely. I, I certainly look forward to that because he, he is capable. He can speak English. He spent time in the States. He used to go to, I think he went to, you know, university or, or high school. I think university in the States as well. So he's definitely, he can speak English. He knows the language. He 
you know, he's more West, he's quite Western as well in his style when you look at his Instagram and so on. So I, I certainly look forward to, you know, what he can bring next um, via Hollywood or what Hollywood can bring him next. So now we can talk a little bit about Ip Man. Is there anything that you would like to highlight um, for the audience, for them to pay attention to in both Ip Man 1 and 2? Anything that you spot that is different, that is uh, there's a significance and it's very refreshing in terms of martial arts cinema. Um, well, the first thing I guess I can say that the reason that I think It Man is such an amazing film, and I would go so far as to say that it's the best martial arts film of the 21st century. I don't think anything has come out since the year 2000 that can match It Man, that first film from 2008. It's just extraordinary. And I think that what that film does is what all great martial arts films should try to do. Not all of them succeed at it, but when you have a martial arts film, what makes a movie a martial arts movie is that not only is there fighting in it, but the story is advanced and the characters are understood through the fight scenes. So in a lot of ways, a lot of different perspectives, if you approach martial arts movies more as like spectacles, like, okay, here's the part where we can stop paying attention to the story and just watch people fight. That does martial arts cinema a disservice. The best martial arts movies have great storytelling within the fight scenes. Every fight scene should tell a story. I believe the scholar Aaron Anderson called martial arts fight scenes movement narratives. So there's movement happening, but they're stories. They're telling stories, they're giving information. And I think that It Man is one of the best examples of that. Every single fight scene, is very compelling. They're shot very well. They're edited very well. The music, the sound design is excellent. The actors are great in terms of their performances, the choreography, the execution of the martial arts. It's all great. You tick every box in terms of what we're looking for for a cool martial arts movie. But then what it does better than most martial arts movies is every fight scene tells a story. There's a small little arc in every fight scene, whether it's Ip Man spanking Jin, literally spanking him and teaching this petulant little boy a lesson, or the big defense of honor of Chinese martial arts of the Chinese nation in that duel with General Mira at the end. However small, however big, every single fight scene tells a story. Every fight scene advances the themes. Every fight scene gives you insight into the characters. I think that is the number one selling point of Ip Man, that every single fight scene tells a story and tells a great story and tells that great story very well. So that would be the first thing that I would point to. Then beyond that, I think that it's some of the best choreography and execution of martial arts that I've seen. And I think big credit to that goes to Sammo Hung. Of course, he shows up in Ip Man too, but behind the scenes in both films, doing the action directing and the choreography, Sammo Hung, he's sort of a neglected figure in martial arts movie history. I don't know if it's just because he comes from more of the comedic school and it's not as cool or serious as Bruce Lee. I don't know what it is, but he is someone who has played such an enormous role in the history of Hong Kong martial arts cinema number one and in the evolution of the choreography. So the reason that they wanted Sammo Hung to do the man films was because he actually had involvement with earlier films dealing with Wing Chun. So Wing Chun as an art form was never that popular and certainly never popular within movies. So beyond Bruce Lee doing, I mean, almost every movie of his, there's at least one little Wing Chun sequence. But beyond Bruce, Wing Chun wasn't hugely represented in either Hong Kong or Hollywood movies. So the fact that Sammo Hung had some experience with it, he was the obvious person to go to. But just his style of directing and choreographing it's very fast. I think if you're going to look to one thing that sort of Sammo Hung brought to the table, the speed of his fight scenes are very different than other fight scenes, especially when you look at stuff like the 70s post Bruce Lee, stuff like Lao Kar Lung. The techniques are great. It looks great, but it's very slow and it seems more dance-like than fight-like. With Sammo Hung, it's so fast there's a lot of actual content with the blocks or the hits that also comes from Jackie Chan being a nutcase stuntman type of guy who, yes, hit me and we'll put pads on you and I can really hit you. That, of <laughs> course, helps the choreography. But Sammo Hung brings that kind of speed and authenticity to his fight scenes. So when you see something like Ip Man, 
especially the sequence when he's fighting the 10 uh, Japanese martial artists, which is now one of the most iconic sequences in the history of martial arts cinema. Just the choreography, it's very realistic, but it also looks fantastic. And that's the kind of duality that Sammo Hung especially brings to the martial arts cinema table. And it helps immensely throughout it, man. It's very realistic. The techniques are excellent. And the speed is off the charts, especially when multiple people are coming at it, man. The idea of sort of the multiple attacker thing has a history in Wing Chun. It was something that Ip Man was concerned with as a teacher, being able to teach. A lot of people are coming at you. It's not just one-on-one. -on -one. You're not in a boxing ring. People are going to jump you. You're going to have a bunch of people and their friends. That might happen. So you need to be able to deal with more than one person. I think that has been maybe the weak point in all of martial arts movies. Even Bruce Lee movies, sometimes it's a little rough when it's like, okay, there's a circle of 12 people. You go first. Then you go, then you go. That kind of one at a time logic that sort of ruins the idea of, well, that's not what it's actually gonna be like. Here, it's like four people are throwing kicks at him and he's blocking at the same time. He's hitting this person, hitting this person, keeping his footwork great. So it's very grounded in the techniques of Wing Chun, but also very realistic, shot very well to where I buy this and it looks amazing and it's very compelling and the story is moving forward. Just every box that you can tick, it man ticks it. You sounded really well, Kyle. Well, I agree with you. I think, I think, well, I haven't seen as many martial arts movies as you. I don't think so. Well, I've seen some of the Chinese ones. Um, but I think you definitely have seen more than more than I. But there's something about Ip Man. I think, like you said, I think the standards is really high. You know, Bruce was great. He had a great persona, character, and, you know, his screen presence and everything else he could find and so on. But in terms of the production design and the, and the quality of the production design and the execution of everything, I think Ip Man is definitely really up there. I haven't seen anything quite like, even with the coaching tiger, coaching tiger, hidden dragon, hidden dragon. It's, it's you know it's a different type of martial arts movie, and even gives you that thrill of the speed in the fighting. It has a story. It has you know you you can understand the character, the emotional journey that he's going through, and and so on. And so on. I think on every every level, even it just. For me, it's a very, very good production. I think, I think all these Hong Kong guys, they must, they, they must have felt very proud. You know, it's something that they can demonstrate that they can still produce. This is something that what they can do. You know, if they work together, this is what they can achieve together, to show you know the world, international audience, what martial arts cinema or Hong Kong martial arts cinema is about. I think, yeah. And how about Yip Man Chu? Is there something else that Yip Man Chu that we should pay attention to too? Apart from the presence of some summer home, of course, that and the icon and the iconic fight scene that him and Ip Man were doing on the table, um, that was very well, very well made. That scene, I think, and very, yeah. very significant, just historic. I think that fight scene was historic. Given the summer home was a senior, you know, Donnie Yen was a Jumbo junior, and I think on the meta narrative level or in the scene itself, it just it was a very um, historic moment. I think. Yeah, yeah. It Man 2 is interesting that both of the films, something I didn't touch on, but is worth mentioning that both of the films are also really interesting because they kind of do what I was alluding to where they're absorbing and extending sort of cinematic inheritances. And what's interesting is that they're doing it both East and West. So both Hong Kong cinematic traditions and Western cinematic traditions. They're kind of absorbing everything and then sort of moving things forward. So Ip Man 2 is interesting because it's more explicit about sort of paying homage to different cinematic traditions. Ip Man, essentially Fist of Fury, but beyond that, it's sort of doing its own thing, carving out its own path. Ip Man 2 then is more of an elaborate homage to all these different traditions of Hong Kong martial arts cinema. You have the very grounded, very realistic choreography. Then you have the wire work. You have the more elaborate stunt stuff. And then you have the clash with the Westerners and you have the um, incorporation of Western boxing versus Chinese boxing. But on the narrative level, it's also interesting that if you can make the case that Ip Man 1 is essentially a remake of Fist of Fury, you can make the case that Ip Man 2 is essentially a remake of Rocky IV. And that might seem like a very strange thing to pull from, but that's one of the cool things about these movies is they're taking cinematic traditions from anywhere. Anything that has 
like a really good arc or something that really speaks to people, the Ip Man films sort of absorb it and then extend it. So Rocky IV is the classic film when Stallone defends America against Russia and the evil Soviet boxer played by Dolph Lundgren, Ivan Drago. That's the same basic premise of Ip Man 2 with Sammo Hung defending, America, uh, defending uh, Chinese honor, just like Apollo Creed tries to defend American honor against the incoming Soviet. And Sammo Hung dies in the ring, just like Apollo Creed dies in the ring. And Ip Man has the towel and he wants to stop the fight, just like Rocky wants to throw in the towel yeah. and save Apollo. But they both say no. The interesting thing is the reasons why. So this is where you have the tradition, you have the precedent set, but then you have Ip Man sort of going its own way. So in Rocky IV, the sort of theme is, is there anything beyond fighting? So Rocky and Apollo are professional boxers. Apollo Creed was the champion for a long time. Rocky dethroned him. Apollo retires, starts training Rocky. Now Rocky's on top. By Rocky IV, they're both older men. They're not the same anymore. They don't have the same speed. They don't have the same power. Maybe it's time for Rocky to even retire. Apollo's not cool with that. Apollo doesn't do the retirement thing. Apollo says, I'm a warrior. And without a war, the warrior may as well be dead. So he's going to fight. Ivan Drago is literally killing him. And he tells Rocky, no, promise me, you're not going to stop this fight. Because for him, I would rather die a warrior than live just some normal guy. That's sort of the arc for Rocky IV. With Ip Man 2, it's interesting that Sammo Hung is cast as Apollo Creed, and Ip Man is Rocky. But for Sammo, it's more about doing penance. So Sammo's arc is very similar to the, the Officer Lee from Ip Man, where he sort of compromised himself as a Chinese man. So in Ip Man 1, he's, Lee is the interpreter. So he's collaborating with the Japanese. In Ip Man 2, Sammo Hung is collecting protection money for the British, for the evil, corrupt guy. So he's compromising. He's selling out his people. So when he's in the ring, he tells Donnie Yen's Ip Man, don't stop this fight. Not because, well, I don't want to retire. No, it's like, I need to do this for myself and my own sense of honor. I have penance. I've committed sins. I need to atone. There's that kind of theme. And I need to just show the endurance and the resilience of the Chinese spirit and the toughness of this branch of martial arts. So you're taking a seed that already has been planted in Rocky IV, but then you take it in your own direction. That's one of the interesting things that these Ip Man films do. And Hong Kong or Hollywood, they're taking these established traditions and then taking them in great different directions. So that's one of the things that I would highlight for Ip Man too, that it even connects to the Western tradition leading up to Ip Man giving his own speech, just like Rocky at the end of Rocky IV, uniting America and Russia. Donnie Yen can unite Hong Kong and Britain. Wow, I've never really heard that um, comparison before, Ip Man 2 and, and Rocky IV, really. It's only, it's only coming out from you, Kyle. It's just such, <laughs> that proves that you are the, you know, the scholar, you know, for, for martial arts cinema. So now we're going to, I want to ask you some last questions before we, we finish today. Is that what do you expect for the future? You know, what else do you want? You, you certainly have seen a lot, you know, you know, the history about martial arts cinema, not just, you know, Chinese martial arts cinema, but martial arts cinema um, um, in America as well. So what do you expect to come out from uh, the region of Hong Kong and also by extension, greater China? What else will excite you? Or what else do you think that can create that? I wouldn't say like another Bruce Lee moment, but I think the production of Ip Man, that's what the, all the producers were trying to do. They were trying to create a second Bruce Lee moment internationally. Um, of course, it, you know, it has the resonance, but it wasn't as big as Bruce Lee because of the different time, you know, historical background and so on. But it, it, I think it achieved well. So what do you think now will, will come? What do you expect now after Ip Man? I think Ip Man is pretty much done now. When you look at, we were just talking about, you know, three and four is... It's not, it's not quite the same as the one and two. So I think the Yip Man series is pretty much done and it will become a history of, for, for itself. And also they try to do different things, different spin off for Yip Man as well. And that didn't really work well. So what do you think is the next breakout for Hong Kong or slash Chinese martial arts cinema? Um, After well, Yip Man. Can we have maybe like a female figure? 
They yeah, never really think, had a female figure. Yeah, I think the question of what do I expect and what do I hope, different sort of inflection. So what do I expect? I really don't know, but it seems that the general efforts have been to really connect historically to sort of some Chinese roots and to promote different Chinese martial arts through movies. So I wonder if there are going to be more attempts to, well, here's the Wing Chun movie. Now here's the this movie, here's the that movie. I don't know mm -hmm. if maybe you go through different styles. I don't know if it becomes something like, well, we had Wong Fei Hung, we had Ip Man now, do we find another historical figure? And do we try to create another sort of contemporary folk hero? Maybe mm -hmm. that's another lane to go down. And then, like you mentioned, the sort of gender lane. So, okay, we have the Bruce Lees, the Jackie Chans, the Donnie Yens, the Jet Lees. But really, I mean, initially, there were great female martial arts icons right when the sort of Shaw Brothers Golden Harvest thing kicked off from the 60s to the 80s. So you had Chang Pei Pei, you had Angela Mao, and then into the 80s, you had someone like Michelle Yeoh, who also gets sort of overlooked in this conversation since not only was she in the film, film Wing Chun, she was the star and Donnie Yen was her co-star. And it's very interesting watching that film and seeing different elements of her female Wing Chun practitioner and her sort of character traits and her fighting style, seeing some of that show up in Donnie Yen's Ip Man, but that's another conversation. But you have those types of female martial arts icons. But yeah, since the 80s, there hasn't really been in the Hong Kong context, anybody to really take up that female warrior mantle. And that's definitely another avenue that is open to someone who can come in and sort of capture that national sentiment and have that universal appeal from that gender perspective of being the female warrior, because we have that in Hollywood in spades. This is the time where you have the female action heroes taking over. You have the Wonder Womans, you have the Furiosas, you have people like Charlize Theron, you have a lot of female action heroes really taking over the action movie space in Hollywood. I do wonder if maybe Hong Kong will follow suit and have something similar happening in their cinema. I'm not going to make any predictions. I don't know if that will happen, but that is something that would definitely be an interesting development to see. Yeah, me too. That's what I'm looking forward to see as well, whether something like that can come. It doesn't have it doesn't have to be a historical contest, you know. I think it can be something that is historical, maybe the style is historical. It can still be a very contemporary con contemporary setting, but you you know the 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 female lead can embed some of the tradition of Chinese um martial arts or the philosophy behind it, but it doesn't have to be a period um setting. It can be in contemporary as well. That's what I'm trying to imagine, you know, just like a a female warrior figure, she can fight quite well, but then all the problems that she needs to solve is contemporary, so that people can relate to that as well, but not necessarily as a combat as well, because that's the thing about martial arts, it's not always to win the fight or to be someone, you know, to be someone up, something, it's, it's the attitude towards life as well in martial arts, so um, yeah, I would like to see something like that, I think. I think that could be another breakout for um, Chinese martial arts cinema. And now that we have all the, you know, male figures and, and male stars already, it, it can be quite refreshing. Or even a, a kid. I don't think a lot of the female martial arts icons got that push. So historically, yeah. you can point to this person, point to that person, but I never really felt that like the industry was behind them. It never no. felt like this is their Enter the Dragon. This is their Ip Man. It didn't feel like you're not going to get the best, like what we were talking about, that the standard of Ip Man's filmmaking mm. is so high. That hasn't happened yet for a female martial arts vehicle. So someone like Michelle Yeoh, her films are interesting, whether you look at something like the Yes Madam film with her and Cynthia Rothrock from the 80s, that's contemporary. That's a modern urban setting. Or you look at something like Wing Chun, which is a historical period piece. In either context, there are interesting sort of explorations of gender and what it's like to be a female martial artist. So mm -hmm. whether you're um, historical or contemporary, you can do that, but it hasn't really happened yet. And it hasn't happened in the same way as something like an Ip Man, where this is a big production. This is tremendous filmmaking skill. And this is the kind of movie that we're going to make with this kind of star in the leading role. So yeah, that hasn't happened yet, but I would love to see it.
Me too. So that maybe that's something that I can I can try to push as well, writing commentary article, getting people's attention, and just to get people some um, ideas going, perhaps. But we'll, I'll be I'll love. To, I don't know what it is yet, but I can see it. And I, I look forward to seeing that. Yeah, but it has to it has to have the standard of filmmaking, you know, the production value as well, like Iman. Maybe Iman, he didn't have any daughter. Anyway, but thank you very much for having uh, to had to to spend your time with us, and it's such a pleasure to have you as always. It's such a joy to talk to you, Kyle. You know so much about martial arts cinema. I always learn so much from you. It's such a great pleasure to to talk to you as always. Yeah, thank you for the invitation, and yeah, if anyone who's watching this, I hope you enjoyed it. And yeah, that's always my number one thing. I do want to inform people, but I also just try to communicate how awesome this stuff is and try to convey that enthusiasm then to get people like, well, I should watch this movie. That guy seems to like it a lot. So yeah, they're great movies. They're a ton of fun. You can learn a lot. And just the different historical connections, the different martial arts connections, the level of the cinematic production, there's more reasons than you can count why martial arts cinema has been such an amazing cinematic tradition just across the board, Hong Kong, Hollywood, doesn't matter. If you haven't seen many, you should watch more. If you haven't seen some for a while, you should rewatch them. <laughs> Thank you very much, Kyle. Hope to see you and speak to you again. Stay Same safe and take you. care. Bye now. Bye.